after listening to that last presentation, I just almost want to yell, but um, probably went from a type 2 to a type 6. The, uh, uh, what we're going to cover is we're going to teach you everything about phone systems for beginners. We're going to tell you how normal phone systems are deployed. We're going to tell you how open source phone systems are deployed, what exists. We're going to show you examples of how to script your own phone systems, how to make your own phone systems, and what they can do that other phone systems can't do. So hopefully, can you see me moving this mouse cursor around up here, and is there something going on here? Yeah, I know. We're, gonna, we're hacking this so that we have two screens because we've got a lot of information. So we're, we're making a little modification here. So um, that's actually an old presentation. Isn't Mac OS X great? I was uh, asleep. Um, last time I slept was probably about uh, two and a half days ago. And uh, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these wonderful slides you're going to see I did in a uh, Mac OS uh, sketch application, which I compiled in the car on the way here. So um, you know, some of them aren't the highest quality, but uh, the info is all there. So let me, uh, let me pull something out here, actually. OK, so I'll start at the beginning. Um, yeah, in the beginning, about uh, 18, uh, late 19th century, um, Bell and possibly some other people came up with this cool phone idea. Um, basically, saved the world a tons of, ton of time. Um, you know, made the world free for democracy. And actually, if you take one of those old piece of crap phones and plug it into the phone system today, it still works. And that was a killer hack. Um, there have been very few improvements since then, but we're we're still looking. And we think that open source software is probably the way it's going to happen. Because this has been the most patent-ridden um, proprietary market that uh, you know, software has ever seen. So um, let me hit it. So we actually are developers on the GNU Common Bayonne projects. Um, the GNU Common Bayonne projects are open source projects that uh, implement application servers and a variety other, of other servers that you can script your own telephone systems with. We're going to show you how to do it from basic voicemail stuff to um, very complex systems. And go back to sketch. All right. OK, so here, assuming you were a business or an individual, your first phone system is something like an answering machine. You got four line phones. These little uh, you know, slashes with fours there indicate four lines. It's hooked up in parallel with the four phones coming from the phone company. You got a switch. Later on, maybe you get a key term, what's called a little switching device. And that's an important distinction from the answering machine. Um, the key term is a switching device, whereas the answering machine is a, actually it's an application server. It's, a, it's called an interactive voice response server. What it does is it interfaces a person to a computer. You've got an interface that's just a keypad, speaker, microphone. Anything you can interact with on a computer is interactive voice response. And that's, that's what an answering machine is. So the key term, if you guys are into networking and you don't know about phone systems, the key term is like a NAT box. Basically, it takes a few lines in. You see the few lines coming in there and splits it out into a whole bunch of lines. And uh, what you can do is you can, there's, there's also the concept of hunting now. Where, which you didn't have probably After that, you very well might end up with a computer-based phone system. And there are some cool things about having an all-in-one integrated computer-based phone systems. There are some really lousy things, too. Um, some of the cool things are, uh, first of all, you don't have lots of pieces of equipment that may or may not work together. You, have, you don't uh, have to use up um, extra resources connecting these two together. There are a lot of resources actually used there. Um, the computer-based system can also interact, possibly, with your, say, your database or your website or whatever. Um, 
Any questions on that so far? I mean, that's basically kind of the evolution of these types of phone systems. Um, there's a little bit more on this. I'll show you a few more. Let's see what we got. Okay, so less often seen are systems that are based on uh, splitting out the interface from the logic entirely. Um, this happened in the 80s, uh, or kind of be gained favor in the 80s because people came out with programmable switches. They were just dumb. All they did was a switching part. They connected one port to another. Um, you had to have a computer there that watched everything and told them everything to do. You know, connect this port to that port. Oh, you hear a ring. Um, pick, it, pick up the, the line, you know, uh, transfer it, whatever. You had to tell them everything. So the CTI and channel bank method is how you would do a dumb interface um, in your office. And the CTI and programmable switch method is how a central office would do it, how a phone company or somebody else would do it. Subtle difference in that the uh, programmable switch is uh, a little bit more intelligent and a lot more capable. Um, all right. I know I've got another one here. Nah. All right. So there are a lot of different ways to create phone systems, though. And what people are doing with voice over IP now, does anybody here not know what voice over IP means? Or probably. You guys just aren't going to. The first person who at least says he doesn't know what voice over IP means gets a shirt. All right. And it's a cool shirt, by the way. It's like this, uh, you know, all cotton and uh, rock shirt. So, and by the way, has, has anybody in here ever written a device driver? All right. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If you've written an advice driver, you can come up and grab me. I'll explain my stuff. Um, I only brought three of them. Sorry, I'll, I'll probably have more in, uh, in John's booth downstairs. Um, all right, so uh, Dan, is that computer up? Thanks. Um, OK, so voice over IP. Um, is basically means you're sending voice over internet protocol in a packet switched manner. Um, internet protocol is you know part of the suite of protocols we use every day. Um, basically, uh, sending voice over it involves having compressing the voice, having a session protocol that understands how you set up a phone call over you know this this packet switch network, having you know compression codecs that are efficient. Um, and all of the lower layers. Um, generally, what people have used it for in the past is things like toll bypass. Say you want to call uh, across the country and you don't want to pay the long distance bills or to another country. You don't want to pay the long distance bills. You can compress the voice, send it as packets over the internet back and forth, decompress it at the other end, negotiate. The two people can talk through, say, a computer or average PC with sound card speakers. And uh, you get intelligible voice usually. Depends on your internet connection, of course. But uh, voice over IP basically is, is commonly used for that. You don't pay any long distance fees. So it can be cool. Um, lots of other reasons it can be cool. Um, things like, you know, if you, if you had your, if this was a phone cable and I pulled it out, you're hung up. You know, but that's not the case with with voice over IP. I didn't just, OK. So um, yeah, there may be some smoke here. Um, lots of things aren't going to work, but we've got so many demos that it does, just doesn't matter. Um, so let me explain to you uh, kind of a, an interesting, tweaky way of making a phone system that uses voice over IP. Um, imagine that these are, these are little computers with connections to, this is the phone system, by the way. That's what these things are. And these are phones. You like? OK. Um, so 
you've got these computers that are connected both to the internet and to the phone system. They've got interfaces to both. A network interface for packet data, a network interface for circuit switch data, phone lines. Um, you have, these computers are able to gateway data from either network. They're called gateways. Um, you generally connect, you can connect analog phones to them. That's called a station port or an FXS port. Just connect a phone right into them. Talk away either over the packet switch network or the circuit switch network. Um, you can talk to other gateways. You can get a set of cooperating gateways together. There are groups of people, us included, who have formed our own vo voice over IP networks. And it's not that hard. And uh, we're going to explain how to do that too. Um, I'm going to probably, I might come back to some of these. Um, but I don't want to go over your head. Um, so I think I'm going to start with stuff that, how ready is that computer? Not ready. Um, OK. Um, I'm just going to explain then the first demos, and then we're going to give them as soon as that computer's ready. Um, here's, here's an old architecture that we had for our system. Um, basically, we work on the GNU Projects Communication Subsystem. Um, that doesn't mean a lot to most of you, um, but what it means to us is that we are trying to get a fully functional, complete set of software that you can use to build your own phone systems, and we're making it part of the GNU project. Um, there are several components. As you can see, we've got one called BAM. We finished this one. Babylon finished this. Working on that, trash that, trash that, working on that. I'll cover some more stuff later, but this one here, basically all of these are daemons, they're servers that carry out a small portion of the functionality that you need to make a full range of phone systems. However, standalone, they can do quite a bit. Um, Bayonne is the one that I'm going to cover first, and that's an application server or interactive voice response server. Like I said, interactive voice response, <coughs> super set of tons of stuff. Um, voice messaging, call center type stuff, um, covers a lot. Any interface, <coughs> were we supposed to have water? Between a, uh, between a human and a computer. So that's, that's interactive voice response. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit of, <coughs> okay, this is a good one. So we generally stick to a three tier architecture. So those of you who develop web apps, you have an interface language. <coughs> it's called HTML. It's simple. You know, describe it in a small document. You can, you can figure it out. It does one thing. It describes the interface to the end user, to the, the client. Um, then you have a logic layer. And that's what your, say, your application servers do. Um, maybe your Perl scripts or your CGI. Um, if you program using those. Uh, then in the back, you've got your data. So there's three tiers, clean separation. Um, we like it. Very nice. Um, there are a lot of servers that operate the same way. Um, Apache operates this way. Bayonne operates this way. That's the IVR server. We have a little interface language. <coughs> and it's stuff like uh, you know, play a prompt, record a prompt, listen for the guy to press some digits. These are how he's interfacing to it. Yeah, what's up? Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry about your laptop, man. Um, OK, first casualty, the laptop. Um, you can't see all the spackles, though. Um, OK, so <clears throat> we also are able to execute application logic with the own, just like CGIs. We call it TGI, um, basically the same thing. Let's go here. Um, we got to start giving some of this stuff away. Who's, uh, who's, who understood what three tier meant? Who's ever written a Bayonne application? That's too many people. You do not count. Oh, wow. That's a bummer. Um, OK. Who wants to write a Bayonne application? OK. You look kind of evil, so I'm going to give you the horns. What, did we have another one? Uh, 
Am I good? So <coughs> TGI. Um, TGI is just like CGI. It's uh, basically you pass information via environment variables. Um, pretty simple stuff. What you do is your uh, your application comes to a point where it decides, I need to take some information from the user, like, say, uh, digits pressed on the keypad. Um, and I'd like to pass that to, say, a Perl script. It takes them via TGI, passes them through environment variables. There's a little Perl module, just like with your, uh, your three-tier web application, uh, broker that. So there's some other application servers that uh, Bayon is supposed to work with. Um, we're also trying to get to this to work with the uh, uh, GNU Enterprise project. They have an application server as well. Uh, basically what that does is it takes form interfaces that are business forms, like you know shipping, receiving, accounting, those kinds of guys, three-tiered. The back end, they do some logic when you fill out your form. Um, you know, product gets shipped. Um, lots of stuff we can integrate with them. Um, I'll cover a little bit of that later. Go back to these sketches. Um, all right. What's up? Okay. So here's one application. Um, <clears throat> we started naming all this stuff, uh, you know, with acronyms, you know, like uh, TOC and PSCT and and stuff like that. But it, it was impossible to find new acronyms, so we're calling it naming them after donuts. And this one's called Super Donut because it's a, a totally killer application. Um, it's a really good example of CTI. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to give you that as a demo because the machine that we had interchange running on is not here. And we'll probably demo it later in, uh, in the uh, showroom floor. Um, what this does is it allows you to purchase applications, or rather, uh, purchase goods, track goods, do everything you could do with a shopping cart over the phone. Now, granted, you wouldn't want to do a whole lot of that over the phone, but you would want to do a little bit. You'd want to track the goods. You would want to buy like movie tickets and pizza and things that you buy when you're on the road. Um, if your internet was down and you had to get something, you'd still want to get it. And so you'd be able to, you know, go through a menu, pick items out of a list, buy things. This is just, you know, a pretty good example. It's Interchange and Bayonne, again, actually, basically, those aren't on the same level. Apache and Bayonne. Um, are on the same level, uh, cooperating together, sharing the same data. We use the same backend that Interchange uses. Yeah, okay. Interchange is a, uh, this is going to be interesting. Interchange is, oh, oh really? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Interchange is a shopping cart, just so you know. So what I'm talking about, uh, Buying things on the web, being able to do transaction completion on the phones, etc. That wasn't one of mine, was it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's going to be a challenge. Um, okay. Um, Okay, I'm about to show you a, a demo of Bayon. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to see it, which which stinks. Can we use this box to so that I can see it too? Okay. Um, can you? We can switch them. Yeah. Back and forth. Okay, we'll just switch them. Okay. Um, we're actually making a load the application on here and display it. Yeah. Do you have like a CC script file? No. No. And just just the text file. This is going to be a little kludgy, but I'm going to show you the first apps over here. Jason's will be less kludgy. What's that? What, what do we have to give this guy? Spark. Oh, yeah. Um, we've got a uh, Spark for you with uh, HPUX and... Uh, is this yours or is this this? No, it's DevCons. DEF CON staff. DEF CON staff? Oh, okay. Who likes are, hockey? Are we actually allowed to give this away? Yeah, that's what we are supposed to do. All right. All right. Well, now, next person who saves our ass gets this. 
it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, we've got an uh, HBox 11, uh, some Microsoft. Uh, right. We've got cookies. We, we actually have others. How about this? Can we give this one? All right. Let me uh, see what's going on here. That. That, that, that is a very phallic box. That's the biggest box here, probably. Yeah. Dude, these are just, this is a minefield. Hockey pucks for you. Dan, you're going to have to be my, my cable slave. You're twisting again. Can you switch cables for me when I need it? Alright. So, what is it you're going to do? Thank you. Thanks. Um, just a second. So, what I'm going to show you in a minute is uh, a couple of things. Basically, I'm going to run through a Bayon application with you, and uh, I'll show you CC script first, which is the interface language. I know. Switch. This is a buggy hack, but okay, so what you've got here is CC script, and that's uh, our interface language to Bayonne, which is a phone application server. What we're trying to do here is allow you to very quickly, with a small amount of code, design an interface to a phone system and express that. Um, there are a lot of other ways to do it. Um, what this does here is it has commands like um, set variables, clear variables, you can do that, you have the concepts of variables. You also have the concepts of digit traps, where you see the caret, that's trapping a digit. So probably it's down here. But um, So digit traps, basically on a trap digit you execute the code after the trap. That's it. Um, then what you have are other things you can do like um, you can execute Perl scripts with the data that you, you've collected. You can collect data. Jason, am I on a collect Does anyone have a laser pointer? I have one. All right. Yeah, that's very hard. So you can do things like play files, play audio files, record audio files with this. You just have type, what's that? Oh, yeah, maybe I can. Holy cow, we're 24 minutes. This is rad. Okay, so you can set variables. This sets uh, this variable to this variable. Um, basically, you're assigning this variable to this variable. This session variables are one type, and then all other variables are of another type. Session variables are variables that are valid throughout the session and uh, get changed by Bayon. For instance, this contains all the digits that Bayon has collected uh, since the session variables have been cleared. So, question is? Can you pass it to other functions? Yes, you can. You can actually have subroutines. Um, session digits are, very, are valid throughout the session. Um, so, this here is actually a login script. And I made a couple of different login scripts. This one is basically we've collected some digits from the user. Um, we have a, a collect function up here. And we have a deterministic, deterministic way that actually looks in a little uh, ProDB database. This is a libexec call. It's just like a CGI call. Um, this is the name of the Perl script that it's calling. Then we have a randomish method, which actually what this does 
is it looks at the bottom of a uh, file of passwords that were generated, one-time passwords. Um, there's a little Perl script to generate 100 of them. It gets the last one and then deletes it. So basically, when you log into the voicemail system, um, you'll only use one password once. Usually what you'll do is you'll print out 100 one-time passwords onto a business card, and then you'll cross them off as you use them. And they'll be deleted and they won't exist anymore. So that's actually a little bit, I, I figured this would be kind of cool for here because um, it's, you know, of security nature. People couldn't, you know, go in and poke around and delete your files if they were sitting outside with a lineman's phone or something when you, when you type your password in. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, what I'll probably do is I'll just show you Bayon running in trace mode, and I'll show it go through here. We have a debug mode for Bayon, you know, if we don't get blown away. That, uh, um, we'll show you basically all these script steps executing. And you actually, it's pretty cool developing with this because you don't actually have to, um, you know, start and stop the server to change this stuff. It's, it's just like, it's, it's almost like HTML. You can uh, just type one command to the server and the server will then um, recompile all of this stuff internally, all of its scripts. And real time, the application will change as you've, as you've defined it. Um, it won't change, of course, until the next caller picks up on, on a port. Um, a port, by the way, is roughly equivalent to a uh, little phone socket in the back of a computer. So let me put it in trace mode, see if, uh, see if that helps. Excellent. So if I call into the system here, it's, it's a basic voicemail system. I'm just going to show you the hack that I just did. Um, here goes. I'm calling through a little separate switching box here. I could explain that later, but it's not very interesting. So it explains that it's ringing. It's probably, it's asking me to you know, do something. I'm going to press start to log in. Oh, okay. Um, it just asked me to enter my password. I'll, I'll lower it to the mic next time. Um, so that's an invalid password. So it didn't like that. But I will show you now a valid password that I'll get out of the one-time password file. This is the uh, little Perl script that Bayon is going to call to get the um, value out of the password file. And I'll show you the password file too. And you'll understand the script a little better. Uh, so that's just it. There's just a. Uh, bunch of uh, numbers about. What's that last number, Jason? 6970. Okay, 6970. So let's go ahead and uh, look at that post script one more time. Yeah. Okay, so the post script basically has to get a value from the CC script, the interface script that I just showed you. It gets the value where? It's not debugged, so it gets it there, the TGI query. And then it goes ahead and chops it off, um, the last line off, returns it, and then goes ahead and sets the value back um, with the TGI set. And that's it. That's basically a uh, TGI script. So 6970, I think that's it. I can't hear that. Is it? Thank you for calling Open Source Telecom. Please enter your password. You have entered an invalid value. Oh, please. That hurts. Oh, eight 
1.450. That one's deleted now, dude. Oh, wait. Oh, What's that? Oh, never mind. I was going to hold it while you entered the passcode. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is this is basically the way that it works. Um, we didn't enter the right number. The uh, um, other interesting things that you could do with this voicemail system that you wouldn't do with other voicemail systems easily um, is, you know, say, have your voicemail emailed to you so you didn't actually have to use a phone. Um, you know, you can check them on the web or online. I actually did write a little uh, script like that. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So this is a, actually this is way over complicated. Um, I did write this for this, um, well, I wrote it for somebody else, but um, what this does is it just checks a directory and sees if any files have changed, and if they have, it just emails you um, links to the new ones. And that's really all you need to do. You don't need to touch your, your voicemail application or anything. Um, you know, it's simple, it's useful for other things, and uh, you know you can do kind of clean hacks like this if you have a, a powerful system. By the way, the Bayonne is used commercially um, by you know, lots of big companies. We're doing the Enterprise Call Center for Sun with it. Um, there's just, uh, it's, a, it's a robust, mature app. Um, okay, so. What kind of hardware? Okay, very good question. Um, there are a lot of different vendors of, let me see if I have some. Um, okay, I don't. The, um, there are a lot of different vendors of computer telephony cards out there. Very few of them actually have open source drivers, which is kind of bad, because usually what happens is a kernel will rev and your driver will no longer ro uh, load, or you just, you just can't use a newer kernel or something, and, and it stinks. But it's livable. You can deal with it. Um, Intel Dialogic um, has a full line of cards that you can use with, uh, use on Linux, um, Linux only. Um, Voicetronics is a company, an Australian company, that you can um, use. They make a line of analog cards, basically. They'll do call logging, they'll do voice response. You can implement a PBX with it, with their stuff. They've, they've got some pretty cool stuff. And uh, QuickNet is another company. Um, we're going to show you a QuickNet card. We actually have a Voicetronix card in here doing this um, messaging demo. And then we've got a QuickNet card in there. We're going to show you a voice over IP demo with that. And QuickNet makes some single port low density cards that are designed for um, you know, Soho type environments or just you know, personal use. Um, they can be used in gateways. You can throw one or two of these QuickNet cards into a gateway. They're, they do uh, hardware compression and echo cancellation, so it makes your voice, it basically it can improve the quality of your voice over IP, uh, voice over IP call. What are we at? Okay. It's not too bad. What's that? Okay, let me do some terminology. You, you don't know what a codec is? A codec, yeah, okay, I know. Um, the question is, will your codec scale automatically on the fly if your traffic gets heavy? And the answer is generally no. Um, what will happen is they, codecs use, usually have a rated at a certain amount of bandwidth. Um, they're usually named ITU names, like uh, G711, you know, G723, um, a lot of them are proprietary, and even if you reverse engineered them, you couldn't use them. A lot of the really good ones, and it's really sad um, that a lot of the good voice over IP codecs um, are proprietary. They, you would just have to license them. It would be illegal to, to use them even if you reverse engineer them. But most of these cards, companies that make these cards that are specifically designed to do voice over IP, these guys actually license the codecs and put it in hardware on the card so you don't have to purchase it. 
Also, Microsoft NetMeeting has licenses for most of the codecs in it. Um, we're going to show you basically uh, a Linux box here, one of our next demos, showing a voice over IP uh, gateway on a Linux box and a um, Microsoft NetMeeting client just to show you the interoperability. Um, it's, it's not, the situation isn't hopeless. Um, there are people working on really high quality, low bandwidth codecs uh, for voice over IP use that are open source. There's one called Speaks out there. Speaks, yeah. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of, uh, of useful stuff out there. You can also use G711 and GSM. Um, those are two codecs that are about, you know, cell phone quality or toll quality and, and they work. They're not as nice as the other codecs. So we're a little behind on that. Um, do I have any questions on this stuff, on the demo? How Bayon works, how the three-tier architecture? Yes, sir. Handsets. Um, well, basically what happens is when you have a server like this, it's just got ports in back. There are four ports back here. Um, and based on the card that you, you buy, it's an interface card, okay? Um, you generally uh, will buy an interface card to either lines from the phone company, trunk side lines or station side lines, which just connect straight to phones. All your voicemail systems, your answering machines, they just connect to the phone company, you. No, there, there, is an open, there is an open SS7 stack. It's an out-of-band protocol. There are cards that have you know, everything under the sun built into the card in software. Dialogic actually has this thing. Back in the day, we used to make them out of 286s, and we'd put a whole bunch of these Dialogic cards in there, and they have this out-of-band bus, just a ribbon cable going across all the cards, and everything would be done on the cards, you name it. These days, we're doing... Um, Actually, I'll show you another slide on this. Um, we're doing what's called host processing. We're taking everything out of, the out of the expensive DSP cards, and we're putting it into host processing. We're implementing it all in commodity software, making the interface cards very cheap, making it possible to build in expensive systems. You got your hand up a long time. What about ISP and What's that? What about ISDN um, Yeah, actually, the Intel cards all support ISDN, uh, primary rate. Um, there are, um, pardon? Yes, it does. And actually, those are all supported by Intel. They've got a full ISDN primary rate stack. They work, you know, internationally, everywhere in the world. Um, there are basic rate ISDN drivers. Um, I don't have much experience with basic rate ISDN drivers because, frankly, you know, it's just not not viable where I live and, and what's that? Uh, we've used the Fritz card. The, there's this cheap card called the Fritz Cappy card. It's a Cappy driver, right? Well, it's, it's called the Fritz card, but it's, it's a Cappy driver, Cappy and Fritz. You Um, I, um, actually, definitely. I think people will always be compressing it because you'll want to get the most out of your bandwidth. Um, you'll also be doing some other complex things like echo cancellation that are all, you know, basically a cheap echo canceller has like four or five FFTs in it. It's a very complicated piece of software to write. And really good ones, you know, have a lot more. Um, you're always going to have a lot of fairly complex software, at least I think in our lifetime, you know, compressing this stuff and, uh, you know, processing the audio because uh, you have to do it in a packet-based system. Um, I've already taken one from you. I'm going to take one more question from you, sir. Oh, well, I think you actually had it up longer. You in the back? Can somebody, can somebody relay that? Yeah, actually, um, that's another thing that you can do in host processing. We actually have uh, the Voicetronics card does that in host processing. It's got an echo canceller that 
works in host processing, it's not as efficient as doing it on a DSP, of course. Um, Intel cards generally do all this on DSPs. Um, they'll bridge calls. You, there's a simple command in Bayon CC script called join, and you just join two ports together. Um, I can show you that. Um, and uh, let me actually cover a little bit more material before I turn it over to Jason, because I just want to touch on a few of the questions that were asked. No, go for it. Small capacity systems. Um, SS7 is not generally used in small capacity systems. It's, it's, it's usually an out of band protocol. It's used between central offices. Um, there are a few people who are using Open SS7. Like Lockheed uses it between their offices. Um, you know, I really don't know how prevalent it is, how heavily used it is, because I haven't used it. I just don't have to. I'm working on this. I'm working on small systems actually. Um, up to say 96 ports per box. Um, I don't know if any of you guys saw this paper. Okay, if any of you saw this, um, way back in like the late 80s or, or mid 80s, there was this paper done at SGI um, about graphics cards. And it was called The Wheel of Reincarnation, which I'm sure a million things have been called. Does anybody have a copy of that paper? Okay. Uh, uh, oh, there's, there's a tentative. You do? You actually do? Wow. Okay. I think we, you know, I think we're supposed to give away the big computer to the woman with the biggest boobs. I, I didn't, I didn't, that's not me. That's actually what we were told. Um, but the IP, yeah, Constaff. The IP, yeah, Constaff. Oh, and we need evidence. And uh, the, uh, the IPX, however, is yours. Please email me a copy of that paper. So um, the Wheel of Reincarnation basically described how you started out with these really special purpose things like DSPs, um, they're you know, graphics processors, and then eventually the host processors got more powerful and you discovered that you could do a lot more with host processing. Um, and the graphics cards became less powerful. And, but over time, what would happen is that people would realize that you know, there'd be another generation of graphics chips and it'd take it away and, and it'd be more powerful and people would start using you know, high-end graphics cards and it would cycle like this. And that's kind of what we're doing with DSPs in telephony too. Um, we kind of started out with uh, doing everything in, well actually we started out doing everything analog. We didn't have you know, a whole lot of digital stuff. We've gone through a cycle of digital signal processing and we're heading towards a cycle of host processing. And it's just kind of an interesting uh, um, thing to notice. Um, so other projects that I should really mention, um, let me just see if I have a slide on that. Oh, really? That was rude. Okay, so um, other projects that I should mention are, uh, no, that's cool. Um, Asterisk, which is a Linux and FreeBSD compatible based uh, PBX type system. Um, Asterisk is a uh, sort of a, an all-in-one server. It will do primarily switching and primarily uses the channel bank methodology currently that I described to you before where you have a, a computer controlling an interface that's a, a channel bank. Um, it's a little different. A channel bank is a piece of equipment that you might buy from Adtran or um, somebody like that, whereas uh, a computer telephony card is something you'd stick in a computer. Um, it's not a, a standalone box. Um, you get a little bit more flexibility maybe with a uh, standalone computer, um, but it's, it's a viable, what they're doing is a viable way of doing things and it's a very interesting project. You can, uh, 
you can purchase uh, switching equipment uh, that uh, runs Asterisk. Um, I should also me mention Vocal, which is a, an entire suite of voice over IP based applications. Um, it's actually by a company that was bought by Cisco. So they're, well, they're a considerable force in, in open source within Cisco, and all their stuff is based on a session protocol called SIP. For a long time, there was a, a uh, controversy between two protocols for voice over IP. Um, well, not that long, but um, there was this controversy. And you know, there are different camps. SIP is the, the more recent protocol. H323 is the older one. H323 is complex as hell. And it's, it's an ITU protocol. Um, SIP is really simple, ASCII-based, um, IETF protocol. At least it, it was. Now it's getting more and more complicated. So you know, IETF stuff at least starts out kind of cool and, and simple. But it, it's not really that simple anymore. So the, the base out there is H323, but everybody's developing SIP stuff. We're going to show you uh, an H323 thing because uh, it's just what we're using. Um, let's see, what are um, good H323 client, uh, Gnomo phone. Um, and a GNOME meeting. Um, GNOME meeting is uh, basically an equivalent to Microsoft NetMeeting. Um, H323, like I said, is a complex protocol. It covers everything from whiteboard to video to audio. It covers um, little talking heads if you wanted to have a little talking head appear and how the mouth would move if, if you didn't want your face to appear. Um, you name it. So, Anyway, um, GNOME meeting and net meeting support you know, a small fraction of that stuff and are compatible. The only thing that's not compatible, and we're kind of getting back around to the same problem we mentioned before, is uh, the default codec that net meeting uses is a uh, proprietary codec. So you have to set up net meeting to use a, uh, an open codec, which um, the GNOME meeting people have kindly um, created a, uh, a one-button installer for. So you download GNOME Meeting, you can get that, send it to your friends with NetMeeting, they'll be using an open codec. Still be compatible with, uh, with whatever else you're using, probably. How you doing? Okay, I'm going to uh, give Jason the mic. This is Jason Spence. Um, he's not only working on Bayonne and uh, H323 apps, but he also works on a lot of drivers, and he's working on uh, our next uh, switching and gatekeeper, uh, Ipswich. Hi, I'm Jason, and I'm a technical consultant with Open Source Telecom Corporation, the company that Rich and I work for. What I have here is I have NetMeeting running on my laptop. Sorry. What I have here is I have NetMeeting running on my laptop, and NetMeeting is going to establish an H3D connection to a program named PSTN Gateway on this machine, which listens on TCP port 1720. Once the session is established, they're going to start sending UDP packets with audio data between them, and, well, you'll see. Over here on your right, you should see PSTN Gateway calling this phone here. Hold on. going to say hi. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. What about the card? Um, there's a lot of different hardware you can choose for doing voice over IP. A lot of it's very expensive. That's just the way the market is. People are used to paying for telephone service. The internet has a lot very different economics. People are used to getting things for free. 
there's a problem with the telephone industry these days in that it's become so competitive that it's no longer possible for the telephone company to provide the quality of service that we've been used to over the past 10 years. So you have issues like in San Francisco, maybe, does anybody here live in San Francisco? I'm sure you're familiar with the problems getting DSL in uh, some of the high density areas. Okay. <clears throat> well, the telephone company provides a connection to their network using copper. Now this copper sometimes ends up below the water table and it gets soaked and you get a bad connection. Your DSL goes down, your phone connections get crackly. Now these days we have 802.11. In San Francisco there are huge wireless networks being put up by communities and volunteers. These serve the same purpose that the phone company does. They provide a connection to the network and allow people to send data between two endpoints on the network. Now, we're starting a program called OpenTelco. OpenTelco is a community-run telephone network. It takes advantage of internet economics and inexpensive telephony hardware done by companies like Voicetronics in order to enable you to do toll bypass using H323. You can get more information about OpenTelco at, um, I, I think we might have a link on our website. I found out when we set up today that we don't have internet access up here, so I can't show you on the laptop, but. Well, that's right. You, you can get more information about Open Telco at the Unix surplus booth tomorrow in the vendor area. Um. <clears throat> okay. So I, I guess we're over time, but I've got a few other little things I just want to explain because uh, I assume there are some application developers out there. I just had it. Okay, so um, well, I wanted to explain the uh, the next. Oh, hey, I found it. Um, process of elimination. The um, the next step for GNUcom is actually to allow. Uh, developers of applications that have nothing to do with our telephony servers to use a simple API to develop. Um, basically, we have this thing called Fritter, and that's an API library that has extremely simple um, commands like open device, you know, uh, dial, play, stuff like CC script, only in an API method. You get callbacks and so forth. Um, then we've got a, a protocol that is corresponding called Glazed. And the protocol can uh, broker uh, API commands from your application. Say it's a calendar app and it's supposed to page people at a certain time or call them all to you know, do a teleconference or whatever. Um, you're, if you have telephony resources on your box, you just use a library like Fritter with your calendaring app to talk to, say, your voice modem or something. If you have um, telepathy resources, say, in the next office, a big band server running your phone system, um, you would probably have, use, have to use Fritter and Glazed, which would protocol um, the API to BAM. So that's kind of the next step. The other thing that we're kind of excited about doing is um, Bayon NG, which is our next generation um, Voice response server has split out, um, largely split out, all of its drivers for the many cards that it supports. And it supports most of the cards that are supported on open source systems. Um, and we're going to split out that as a, as a standalone library that you can use in your applications as well, and that we can use throughout uh, GNUcom. And we call that Phone Streamer Junior. Um, there was a more advanced attempt at that called Phone Streamer that was based on GStreamer. It actually did everything, multiplexed audio and so forth, but it turned out to be a little heavyweight and complex, so we're going to start out with the library. Um, so that's the main thing. So if, uh, 
anyone with big tits wants this box. Um, it stands. It stands alone. It is. I don't know. You have to show us. I, this is sad. You know. I, 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 we only have one. One. Uh, the, 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 those are kind of. What about dimes? Maybe. Um, you know. I have no idea. That, that's that's part of it. You know. It's just a surprise. Yeah. We'll we'll settle for big nipples. There's a SCSI card on the back and VGA. It's got to be worth something. That's it's the, one of the high density adapters there. Okay, so we're going to take this down to the Unix surplus booth, and you can go ahead and claim it there if you uh, if you're the person with the biggest nipples today. So um, the bots will be down there. Um, you know, I uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, the talk. I know our hacks on the video system were annoying, but uh, hey, you know that's that's what we do. So. What's that? Yeah, um, gnucom.org. Um, and you should be able to get everything from there. Um, let me point at it with the pointer. I hope this is, I hope I'm actually pointing at something. Am I? Gnucom. G-N-U-C-O-M-M. -M. See that? See that little X there? It's moving around. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so gnucom.org. Got it. Um, and actually, I'm willing to take questions until they kick us out. So, um, who's got questions? Oh, geez, yeah. Oh, wow. All right, we got to give you something else, man. Hey, we have a bag of Chips Ahoy here if you'd like a cookie. Um, so, uh, any qu anybody who asks a question from now on gets a Chips Ahoy. Um, that card, if you've got a card, wait and listen to this. Um, that card, I can buy in bulk for $5. And it's a host processing modem. It's a tiny little modem that doesn't do anything much. All it has is a line interface and a tiny little DSP that um, will generate and detect DTMF. And you know, it's, it'll buffer audio back and forth from the phone line to the PCI bus. Now, a number of people have worked on this in the past and had some success in using it as a $5 computer telephony card. But it, progress is really stalled on it. And frankly, I don't have the time, and you've seen my code, I don't have the skill to um, make this thing a viable alternative for hackers who want to set up a phone system that can do anything one of these more expensive cards can do for five bucks. Um, but it would really improve the ability um, or it would make developing phone applications more accessible if somebody would finish off the open source driver for that. Is this thing open with the API? It's been reverse engineered. Completed. Almost completed. Uh, enough to do all the stuff we want to do. What's that? Yeah. Somebody who's somebody who's saying something. Anyway. Reverse engineered yeah. yeah. Um, that was before the DMCA. That was yeah, that was before the DMCA. It wasn't me. I'm only joking. Um, come have a cookie and, uh, and we'll talk. You. Yeah. Oh, geez, I didn't even mention those. Um, CMU wrote a great open source um, uh, voice recognition system and a great text to speech system. They're, uh, what's that? They're, they're pretty killer. Um, Sphinx is the name, um, as in the Sphinx, Egypt of the voice recognition system. Um, and uh, it doesn't have a big vocabulary, but it will certainly work for a lot of these applications if you just wanted to recognize numbers and, and a discrete set of data. Um, speech recognition has got a few problems. Festival is a great text-to-speech engine that's totally open source. It's got a lot of language support. Um, the guys who wrote it actually have a company. They'll make custom voices for you. Um, for festivals, so if you want a voice that sounds just like, you know, Knight Rider, um, or I, 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 I was trying to get them to do Wizards of War, uh, 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 uh. but the, uh, yeah, Max, um, yeah, that kind of stuff, Alec Guinness, whatever, so 
It's called Sepstra, their company, and it's really cool. And these guys are, are doing some great work. They, they still support the open source stuff. Um, and yeah, there's lots of good, good software out there for that. Yeah. You can, but um, some of it is easier than other stuff. Like, they own, for voice response, we've got this system that people make write applications, you know, quick. Um, for doing things like routers and switches, um, we haven't got there yet. Jason's working on one called Ipswich. We'll probably have a prototype out, you know, real soon now. Um, there are relatively inexpensive cards. Generally, these, these cards here, by the way, they cost, you know, well over $100 per port. So you buy a 12 port card, you're, you're probably spending you know, one to two hundred dollars per port, you know, maybe two grand. Um, and, that, and some of them go way higher. Yeah? Now you're talking about like the actual email around there, I should say that, but... A female. But I have one. Are we talking about the uh, box here? Oh, yeah. Males, males count. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, these cards basically, for instance, let's take a, an example. The V12 PCI is, is generally referred to as a PBX card. Each group of four ports on it, it's a 12 port card, is switchable as either trunk or station. So you can have eight phones and four trunk lines to the telco or, um, you know, 12 trunk lines, 12 station lines, the other way around, whatever you want. And, th and a lot of them do work that way. Um, that's kind of a good good way to do it, to jump them. Um, doing it in software is really dangerous. You don't want to um, have the phone company you know, send 100 volts into your station side interface usually. So. No, that's a trunk side thing. That'll allow you to do, say, voice response and so forth. There's also a little tiny, Pavel Machek wrote a little tiny voice over IP client for an old version of a reverse engineer driver for that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, behind that guy. Does the what support? Oh, Bayon? Yeah, sure. Caller ID, yeah, Annie. Yeah, basically anything these cards support, we've probably implemented a feature for. You know, the guys with the biggest feature set are, are Intel Dialogic, and uh, you know, we, haven't, uh, we haven't implemented all of that. But there are people working on it. Oh, I'm sorry, dude. It's maybe it's in my pocket. I, I stole somebody's laser pointer. No, okay. Um, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Who else? So, oh, you. Um, you know what? The software that we're writing, we started on a voice modem driver and never finished it, and that is probably the biggest pain in our butt that we've just never taken care of is finishing the voice modem driver. It's not that hard. You know, we, we can basically talk AT commands. Um, there are just a few, you know, maybe a day of coding or two days of coding to finish that driver. And we get that on the mailings all day long, so I have no idea why we haven't finished it. Sorry, dude. Did we give this away? Well, yeah, we gave this away and the dude took off. Wow. He, he, I, I wonder if he's going to send me the document. Is the guy who, who won this still here? He's not going to send me the document. Does anybody else have that document from SGI about the uh, Wheel of Reincarnation? It's in the document. No? Um, okay. Has anybody here ever delivered a Ninja Burger? Has anyone ever received a Ninja Burger? Um, Okay. Is anyone willing to deliver a ninja egg for young? Uh, uh, uh. This is this is a cool system. Very compact. Being nice. All right. Our ninja. Come get it. Woo! All right. So. Um, who? Oh. The good. Oh. All right, we've been told to shut up, so I guess that's it. Um, if you guys have questions, you can ask us afterwards. Thanks, man.